Almost all the world's constitutions are documents in which governments tell the people what their privileges are. President Jacob Zuma has not just questioned the work of the Constitutional Court, but also the merits of the Constitution itself. The ANC spent decades fighting the apartheid regime and then many years helping to craft the Constitution. Now people here in South Africa worry that the ANC is attacking the very blueprint, the very foundation of democracy it helped to create. No threat at all to our constitution. Our constitution is secure. It is owned by the people of this country. The rights that it gives them will never be eroded. I would not look to the U.S. Constitution if I were drafting a constitution in the year 2012. I might look at the Constitution of South Africa. That was a, a deliberate attempt to have a fundamental instrument of government that embraced basic human rights, had an independent judiciary. It's, it, it really is, uh, I think, a, a great uh, piece of work that was done. Um, much more recently than the U.S. Constitution, the, uh, Canada has a Charter of Rights and Freedoms, dates from 1982. A pronoun you can choose you can use their chosen name so if someone chooses to change his name from Paul to Peter surely you would use Peter because it's a matter of simple politeness and, and respect if the same person person chooses to cha cho change her name from Paul to Paula won't, I won't use you use the name Paula simply as a matter of respect what's the difference well, well, here well, I guess the issue, and, and, and speak about the legal issue there, is that you're now introducing the full force of the law behind the requirement to use. And I'm dealing, obviously, with, with respect to the pronoun issue. In terms of not addressing somebody by their, by their legally registered name, for instance, um, uh, I don't think that's where we're running into trouble here. I think the issue becomes that if you don't address somebody by the, uh, the pronoun that they self-identify by, as I've read out to you, the fact that the full force of the law will be behind uh, that person, um, that that's what I, I'm uh, finding is tro troubling in the legislation. But the Ontario Human Rights Commission gives per people the alternative not to use pronouns and use the person's chosen name, which is always a respectful approach. So pronouns are not necessary or not mandatory. You can always choose the person's chosen name as a respectful approach. And therefore, I argue... I I'm not aware that anybody that there is a um, a piece of legislation that compels you to use my proper name. In other words, um, it, once again, it's the yeah. fact that the full force of the law will be behind it when we're dealing with the, the group being identified in the legislation. And so, for instance, if I were not to call you by your chosen name, I'm not sure you'd enjoy the full force of the law behind you uh, um, as a result of that. And that's what I'm suggesting to you is the difference here. I'm just arguing, sir, that you always base whatever you say on what the Ontario Human Rights Commission is saying. And I'm quoting from the Ontario Human Rights Commission document. They're saying, we're not manda mandating pronouns. You can always use the person's chosen name as a respectful approach. I respectfully disagree. But then, well, I would say then that's actually an indication of just exactly how poorly the policy documents are written because I can quote this one, which, which is also from the Ontario Human Rights Commission website, that says, and I quote, refu refusing to refer to a person by their self-identified name and proper personal, uh, proper personal pronoun counts, constitutes gender-based harassment. And so if, there, if the policies were written in a coherent manner and there wasn't internal contradictions, then your statement would be a reasonable objection. But since it's not written that way, and I do believe firmly that that's a testament to the, to the degree to which it's a poorly written set of policies, is that it's full of internal contradictions. And that'll be worked out very painfully within the confines of people's private lives. A constitutional amendment to protect parental rights make things worse for parents? Well... <clears throat> What it's going to end up doing is going to be a pipeline to allow direct government action into families. I mean, if, you, if the parents are doing something that is not in the best interest of the child, when should that be protected? Ms. Scott, the, the best interest of the child standard is the, the way it has traditionally worked. Step one. 
you make a finding that the parent has harmed the child. And when that happens, then the parent's right to make the decision is forfeited, or at least limited. At that point, then the court steps in and says, what do I think is in the best interest of this child? This parent is forfeited in the medical care of this child. Now I've got to decide, is it this doctor or that doctor or another doctor? And it's, and it's a decision about who makes the decision. And so if the parent refused to get the child medical care and they clearly had cancer, as an example, the judge is not only going to say, um, you got to have treatment, the judge is going to pick the doctor because he has to. We have never invested as much in public education as we should have because we've always had kind of a private notion of children. Your kid is yours and totally your responsibility. We haven't had a very collective notion of these are our children. So part of it is we have to break through our kind of private idea that kids belong to their parents or kids belong to their families and recognize that kids belong to whole communities. Once it's everybody's responsibility and not just the households, then we start making better investments. A great thing about American democracy, perhaps the greatest, is our emphasis on human rights, personal rights, individual liberty. And they're enshrined in the Bill of Rights, and we don't want to change a word of the Bill of Rights. That has to be exempted in the new Constitutional Convention. But what we want to change is the fact that more and more Americans think of their citizenship as a recitation of rights. They never focus on the responsibilities of citizenship. The greatest responsibility of citizenship is service, and in the new Constitution there should be an article proposing a Bill of Responsibilities.